Uh, okay, so this is the second part of the Fortran uh, part of the course. And I'm going to continue where I left off with a bit more on formatting and also how to write uh, files in Fortran. So just a, a recap here of the formatting, uh, how you format output in Fortran and is by using the second argument to the right statement. And here you specify um, in parentheses in the string, the number of items you want to format a certain, in this case, I have three strings with eight characters. Here I have four strings with five characters. Uh, uh, and then you have, in this case, three floating point values with a field width of eight and three decimals. And here I have four i5, that is five integers, or four i four integers with five widths. And here is the, this implicit loops here you can use to print out multiple values here. Thank you. So just to recap, and then one, one problem we have is, for example, with, with arrays, is that you don't know the size of the arrays perhaps you want to print out or you want to work with. So because the formatting code looks like R, R strings that are kind of fixed, you can't have variables inside these strings. In Python, you would do a formatting string and then format the codes into a string, but we, we can't do that in Fortran. So uh, I want to show you one way of doing it, which I have used in, in several codes. Uh, and I call that method dynamic format codes. As a former strings are static strings, which is kind of not all arrays are the same size. And especially if you grow, um, it's hard to create a formatting string that covers all of them. Um, so we need to be able to create a format code that can handle dynamic uh, number of values. And what we can do is that you can actually use a character string as a file. So we can write to a file. Uh, and instead of writing to standard output, we write to the character string. And it looks something like this. So what you do is that you declare a sufficiently large character string here. So I have a 255 character long FMT format string. Uh, and this is a part of routine for writing out an array. So this should be able to handle different number of sizes of arrays. So in this case here, I, I queried uh, the incoming array here using the size method here, which returns rows and columns. And now I want to create a formatting code. So what I do here is I create another formatting string here. That I want to have uh, uh, one character, one integer, and one character string again. Uh, so you can see here, I put together here a parenthesis, comma, and then the columns here, and G8, which is the formatting I want applied to all of the columns and then end parentheses here. That will write out this part here into this formatting string here. Then I can use this when I do write statements or print statements here. So I can put FMT here. And I, as I know the number of rows is, and also I can loop over the columns here. So now I created a generic write array method here. So just to illustrate here, I will bring up the development environment. Okay. So I have this code here. Um, you can see here I have a module here which I created for my code. Uh, the mo module contains this write array here, uh, which I query and then I print it out here. So let's try it out here with a, let's see, we start with a four by four array. I assign it the value. And then I call this right array here. The indentation is a bit strange here. So let's compile this and define my GIF codes. I will show you this environment here uh, at the end of the lesson here as well. So if we run this here,
you can see here that it prints out a nicely formatted array here of four by four. But you can also handle, for example, six by six in the same way. So in the code here, we query the number of columns and we use that to create a formatting string. So if we, we can stop the code here and just to try to see what, what it actually does. So let's run here and, okay. I have to build, uh, So this is a, a development environment for, for C++, which I have added some support for Fortran. So you can actually use this to build and, and run Fortran code. And hopefully it should be able to run the... Why does it do that? Okay, we do it manually instead. We can just print out the format statement here instead. So print uh, star from our FMT. So start here, we, we now we print out the formatting without any formatting, which we, we would like here. So if we run this code now instead here, you can see here it generated a format code here, which was 6G8. And that is a six floating point with eight field width and three decimals. So that makes it easier for us to handle larger arrays. So you can handle uh, nine by nine. There, there is an issue with this code here is that it's, uh, if you go up higher, you probably need to modify it a bit, but it's, it's, it shows you the principle here that you can generate these codes here. And, and it's, as I said, string, string handling in Fortran is a bit more complicated than in Python. Python is much easier to do string manipulation. So you can see that this is a one of the, the problems you have here that you have to, it's hard to kind of create these strings to use for formatting. But yeah, it's available here. You will also go, all the code for, for the Fortran book, you can check out via GitHub. So all the examples uh, with run, runnable examples are there. Okay, so that was dynamic Fortran codes, uh, formatting codes. So uh, up until now, we have only been writing to the first option in the write statement has been a star. And that means writing to standard output or to the screen or terminal, whatever. But that is kind of not always the use case you want. You want probably to read and write to files that you have on your disk. And similar to Python, there is an open statement in Fortran that is used to be able to uh, connect um, an identifier in Fortran to a file on disk. Also to tell uh, the compiler or the, the code well, if it should write or read from, from the files. And there are three modes of, of uh, file operations in, in Fortran. There are text IO, so normal text files that we can do in Python. There's something called name list IO, which is a very special thing that it are text file with named variables in it. It's similar to the JSON files in, in, in what we have seen in Python before. So this is actually um, a way of creating a dynamic uh, input file where you can name things and um, write in a structured way. And that is built into the Fortran standard. And then you also have a third option here to write unformatted IO. So basically binary files. So files that doesn't have any, so you write the, the you, you double with its bits to disk. Um, and when you are done with the file, same thing within Python, you need to close the file. 
And that tells the operating system that we are done with the file and we can continue. And it, it, it's free to write the data to disk and, and, and so on. So we'll start with the text files. So first thing you have to do is open a file. And uh, in Fortran, you don't have a, you don't receive an object for a file object where you can, where you operate on. Instead, you, you create con uh, an ident identifier for your file. So at the top of the file here, you can see here that I have uh, two constants here, in file and out file, and I give them any numbers here. So this can be 42, 84, 96, whatever, any number, uh, which will be unique to that file. Uh, there are two reserved numbers that you should kind of avoid, and that is five and six, which is the can, has been part of the Fortran standard for many years. And five, I think, is uh, output to standard output, and six is standard input, so reading and writing from from keyboard or from to the terminal. Uh, so what you do first when you want to uh, read a file or or write a file is that you associate your identifier with a file name just like in Python. And then you add how you want to access the file. So access is sequential, that is a text file. And then what you want to do, action read. So now we have open the file in dot dot for reading. And that means that the file must exist on disk to be able to read it. So here you have read in file. So here you specify in the read statement the uh, identifier for your file, and that is where Fortran will read from. So now you see in file is associated with in data, and then you just use the identifier here all the time. And when you're done with your file, you close it, and uh, then the operating system releases all locks on the files and, and so on. Same thing if you want to write a file, you change the action here to write instead. And then you see we associate dot upon dot with out file, and then you use write instead of read, and you pass the, the identifier along here, and then you write your data here. And the same rules, so now I have a, a star here, that means that it's uh, free formatting, so it will kind of output it with a full precision. And then finally, you close the file. So here in, in uh, Fortran, we don't have an automatic way of closing files. You need to explicitly close the files. So you can't use a with statement like we have in Python. So reading, uh, yeah, here I come to this here. So if you want to read uh, from file and keyboard, if you do star star, which is the preferred way, that means that you read from the keyboard. But there is also five here, which you could see in older codes. Uh, that means the keyboard unit. Uh, so that is all the back, way back from punch cards. Um, and file, you specify your own unit number here, and then you open it here. So keyboard is five and screen is six. And if you open those files, they will actually read from file and uh, read from keyboard and read uh, output to the screen. So you can actually use open here with a five and six as well, and that will connect to the standard input and standard output files. As you can see here, you can use six here to write your screen. Uh, I write the file the same way. So code structuring. Um, I think it's important to kind of have, when you when you start with your code, if you have smaller Fortran programs, it's, it's sufficiently just put them in, in a single main program, and have, if you have a couple of subroutines, but as soon as your code grows beyond a couple of screen sizes or uh, terminal heights, you should try to see if you can extract things out from your from your main program. And that is also for being able to maintain the code. If you have a one store, big source file, it's, it's really hard to maintain it. And, and you need to think about how to modularize your code. And also for reusing your code in other projects, it's, it's Good to have them in, in, so you have a input output module that you use in several modules. You can have that as a separate module, and then you can just reuse that in other, other applications. Um, <clears throat> if you're working with Fortran 1995, the key to modularization is using the module. Uh, and the, my philosophy with modules is that you should pick, um, 
create a module for subroutines and data that are related to each other. So you, you group it in, in logical ways. Uh, you could, of course, have a big meta module with everything, uh, and then you have a main program, but that's kind of not the idea with this. So, for example, here's an example of a finite element code I have been doing. So, you have your main program here, and it relies on four main modules. So, you have a module here, for example, for inputting data, reading data into the code. Uh, we have one output data here for writing data out. We have a module here for our finite element routines. And here we have a solver module here. And this solver module could be a module that we reuse in, in multiple projects. So it, it can integrate it here and, and it doesn't know anything about the other modules here. And then you have a utils module here that contains generic routines that you use in, in all of the other modules. And this, this is one way of, so each of these here are a module file uh, containing different um, subroutines and data, data constants, for example, that you use in all of the other ones. So in, in the actual code, it can look something like this. So I have a program here called stress. It uses input data, output data, finite element, and solve. So the use statements here will make all the subroutines and data in those modules available for the main program. And you can see here, you can have a, modules can use other modules as well. So the final FEM module here uses the UTILS module, which we don't use here in this one. And you can see you have a separate module here. So you can have this interdependent modules, modules that you can connect together. And um, show what this looks in the code as well. So here I have um, example. Okay, I can show you here. So this is a module here, truss here for solving trusses. And then I have a my my routine for creating my stiffness matrix here. Uh, and then it returns you a matrix here from this. Uh, so main module here. Ah, this is the module. Yeah, it's confusing. Module example is called module sample. Um, so let's see if we can just make this formatted. Uh, so in this case, I have uh, some generic modules. These are the utils modules here. I have one defining the data type. So for example, here, DP here is defined in data types here. So I, I put in some of the things I want to use in all my code here. So here I have a single place where I can change the data types of my, my variables in my entire code. And here I use a module here, which I will come to in my lecture here, ISO Fortran environment. So this provides some of the types that are compatible with the uh, C++ data types here. So here you can specify real 64, real 33, instead of specifying this eight number here. Uh, and then I use that in, in uh, module main here. I just import them and then they're available here for me to declare them here. And then I have trust here, which is my main functionality. And here I have, now I can call my, my routine here to compute my stiffness matrix. And this print matrix here is available in the utils module. So here we can see this, I have a lot of code here for doing, uh, here are print matrix, uh, print vector and so on here. So there's a lot of uh, nice feature here to have that is available in, in the entire code structure. So then I call print matrix here. Um, let's see if we can run this.
Yeah, you can see here that it's so this utility routines I have in my MF uh, utils here has routines for printing matrices in, in a nice way here. So, uh, and this this matrix here is the KE matrix, which I printed out here for my for my bar three, which is in my trust module. So you can see you can create really compact pro programs that uh, are easy to read by using modules. So a little bit more about subroutines. Uh, these are, are many new features that have been added to Fortran, uh, which uh, hasn't been possible in Fortran 7.7, for example. So in, in Fortran 9.5, uh, subroutines can have other subroutines as arguments. Uh, and uh, you need to, if you um, you have to declare your your subroutine that you want to have as an argument, in, so that there are, there are um, the same. So if if you declare your own routine that you want to pass over to subroutine, it must be the same type that the subroutine expects. And the sub the procedure type you declare that in the specification part of your subroutine, and internal subroutines can't be used in that case. But just to illustrate here, we have a uh, I've created a function here called tabulate uh, that will take a start interval and end interval and a step. And then you see the third argument of a fourth argument is func. And so basically you can you can uh, add a well, call this function with a function input. So you can actually, and that will call the function you provide here. And the key to this is that you need to declare here in your tabulate interface what kind of function to expect. Otherwise, uh, um, you, you can't call you the, the subroutine must must know how to call the function, and that that you do here. So this part here must be the same as you have here. Otherwise, it won't work. Uh, and then let me see here if I yeah. And here you can see I have used utils. Utils has this subroutine called myfunk here. You can declare it in other modules as well. And then you can actually call it here with my function here. So this is uh, very simple to do in Python. It's a bit, bit more complicated to do in, in, in Fortran, but it's possible. So let's see if we can go to procedures. So here we have our function here. And we tabulate here. So it will call this one here and it will print out the function table. Not so formatted here, but uh, we can add that later on. But uh, and then you can you can have another you can add another function here, just that it has to be the same interface as you declare here in your function. This can be useful in, in certain circumstances to when you want to, um, if you implement a solver, for example, that needs a function that need that depends on a certain function that you want to be uh, user customizable. You can you can do you can do this by using this method here. Another cool feature I have been added to Fortran, which is. I'm not sure if they're looking to Python where they implement a lot of this stuff <laughs> because it's uh, it's very Python-like. So you can have keywords and optional arguments to your subroutines. So in 4.7.7, this was a uh, subroutine had an exact number of arguments. That was it. Uh, it's the same thing here, but here you can actually uh, uh, name your arguments and you can also have optional arguments. You also can give them in different order. So and, and the, the reason for, for adding this is that sometimes you're, if in many Fortran code, you can have uh, subroutines with 10 arguments. And it's really hard to actually, you have to look at documentation to figure out what to, to do. And sometimes you, many of these arguments all only have default um, values. You don't, uh, so by using optional keyword, you can reduce the load of using your, your subroutines in your libraries. Uh, and you can hear, you can add an attribute here, optional, 
And if, if you have an optional argument to subroutine, you can test if that argument has been given to the subroutine. Uh, and in that case, you can you can set a different value. You can take a different path in your subroutine, uh, and you, you test that with a present function here. So let's see how it can look. So in this case, I have a subroutine called order ice cream in my vending machine. I have a number here. I have a flavor. I have toppings. I have three arguments, uh, and in this case, I have. Integer here is a normal argument. There is nothing special with that. Then I have two optional arguments here, flavor and topping. And if you don't say anything, integer number here is uh, ha always have to be there when you call this routine. So you can't, this is not an optional argument. So if you don't do anything, it's it's a required argument. So here I have two op the attributes optional, then it's uh, you don't have to specify. So here you can see if present flavor, them and then you query this flavor here and otherwise you don't say no flavor was given if pressing topping then topping screen and then you can call the routine in different ways so you can call it here this is the minimal way you need so required arguments that you have to give is one argument two then you can have two arguments and you can have three arguments but what happens if i want to give the topping here and don't want to give the flavor. Then you have to, to specify a keyword. So then you give the name of the argument that you want to specify. So if you don't give any keyword, they have to be in the order. Otherwise, you need to specify them with a keyword argument. Here. And you can actually use uh, keyword arguments for any functions here. So you, the, the, the non-keyword argument has to be first, and then you can give the optional ones. But if all are optional, you can give them you, you must use the order or the keyword to use them. Another cool feature is you can do overloading of, of um, procedure or subroutines. Uh, and that is a way of that you have a same, the, the same name of a subroutine with different data type as input. So at compile time, the compiler will decide, oh, this routine is called with a floating point number. Then it will call the subroutine that is has the floating point data type. Otherwise, we call if you could call it an integer, we call the integer version of it. And um, there are some way you, you, to use this. You need to declare interfaces, but you can also use modules to make it simpler. So uh, let's start here with. So in this case, I have a module called special. Uh, and I, I have two functions here that I want to, to be able to provide as a single function here. I have an integer version of a function and I have a floating point version of a function here. And the key to this is that you, in the declaration part of the module, you declare an interface here. So you say interface function, this is the name of the function you want to be able to call. And then you can give module procedure I Frank and R Frank. So here you list the functions that you want to be able to that provides the implementation of this. So if the if the function is called an integer, it will call this function, and if it's called by floating point, we call this function. So using this is very simple. So a user of this module doesn't have to know anything about all this fan fancy stuff. He he can you just use a equals to function a, and because a is an integer. Function will, the function call will actually be this one here. And if the function is a floating point, it will call this one here. So here I have my history here. And I have a special function here with the interface here. This is the key. And then when I run this code here, you can see in the first case, it will call the integer version of the function and output 1764. And if I call it with float into a call and return a flow, uh, print out from that function here. So it will call do this operation here, 
Um, in this case, we'll do this operation here. That's a really cool feature to implement generic um, libraries that can handle different data types. Uh, you can also do operator overloading. So this can be really cool if you want to implement your own data types uh, for vector and matrix operation or any other operations in Fortran. Uh, and there is a keyword here called interface operator. And the operator here is plus minus uh, uh, star and so on too. And then you, you can define functions to handle these operators. Uh, and then you have you have to use your own derived data types here. So if you define your data types and you want to do arithmetic on your own data types, you can do that using the interface operator here. So here's an example. I have declared a vector here that has three components, and I want to be able to add vectors together. And then I can declare an interface operator here. So you can see I want to define plus, and I tell Fortran, plus is implemented in the procedure vector plus vector. And then I have type vector here, function vector plus vector, and then I have two inputs here, v1 and v2, for the vectors being added. And then I declare it here, what type of this, and then I have vector plus vector components equals to uh, v1 some components plus v2 components. So here I use the array features of Fortran to, be, to add those together. And then I assign the components of the uh, vector that is returned here as well. And then you can implement this in a main program here. So I, I have three vectors here, v1 and v2, and declare them like this. And then I can add them together here, just like this. And in this case, this plus here will be the vector plus vector, because I overloaded uh, the, the operator for this type here. So here I have my implementation. And then you can see here, I run this. Okay, I need to specify a word. So you can see that it's added those together. So here you can you can do uh, if you have your own data type, you want to do a, your own arithmetic on them. You can overload them using the interface operator plus here. So you can see here that Fortran is getting more and more object-oriented features. And this is one of the keys to implementing the object orientation in Fortran. Uh, another good feature I, I touched upon it before, you can have uh, you can declare variables in modules uh, either private and public. You can also do that with functions, uh, which gives you a way of implementing libraries with your internal subroutines not exposed to the user of the library, which is a very good way of giving you the freedom to change the library later on. And you can do it with the uh, private access list here. By default, everything in the module you declare is public. So there is no, everything is public by default. You have to actively make it private to, to hide stuff. Uh, so you can see here you have a, integer public visible. So this is a public variable. This is, doesn't have to be declared. That is the default attribute of a variable. Then you can add private here to the attribute and that makes this one uh, internal variable. So it's visible to your own subroutines here in your contain section. Then you also have the way of private, private functions. So you can add uh, access list to your functions here. So private, private function, this is not available to the user of the module, this is hidden. Public, public function is made available, but that is also optional because you, it's by default, everything is public. And so let, let's test this here. So now I have two, mod, two functions and then we create uh, a program here that uses these functions here. So call public function, 
that will work perfectly. If we call private function here, if we build this program, you will get a linking error. So doing private really removes a symbol in your binary. So you, it will not link uh, when you run or when you try to build it. So you need to kind of, this is not allowed. So that will be even, even before you have a binary, if you try to call a private function, you will get linking problems. So it's really, it actually removes it from, from the linker visibility when you do this. So this is a, a bit uh, extra material. So you, you can, you will not get a, a lot of assignments for this, but uh, Fortran also do, do does pointers. So uh, pointer is a reference to a variable. In Fortran, it's strictly typed. So uh, you can't work with uh, untyped pointers. And pointer, uh, things that are being pointed to has to have a target attribute. So you can't point to anything. You need to kind of specify, okay, this variable here will be a pointer target. So you have to add that to, to the things that you want to point to. Uh, and pointers will enable you to return uh, allocatable arrays from uh, procedures, for example. So you, you can uh, declare them as a, point, a pointer and then you uh, pass a pointer over and it will be assigned inside and allocated in a subroutine. Uh, if you want to disassociate a pointer from a target, you can use the nullify function here to uh, nullify the pointer and make it uh, not connected to a target anymore. Uh, and also the equal uh, greater than sign operator here is used to associate a pointer with the target. So in this case here, we have an uh, integer allocatable two-dimensional array here, A. It has an attribute called target here. That means that uh, pointers can point to this uh, array. Uh, but there's no difference from any other variable in this, just that uh, for the compiler knows that this here uh, can be used with pointers. So you allocate it just like normally. Then we have a pointer B and C here. Those are two-dimensional arrays. A pointer is a two-dimensional array, as I say. So these are uh, pointer variables. And if I want to point uh, B to A, I do B points to A. And then you can use B just like you, uh, it would have been A here in this case. Uh, and I can do things like this. So I have a routine here called create array D. I have integer dimension colon comma colon pointer D. And then I can allocate D here inside my subroutine. So this here uh, comes in here. You can see I pass C to the create array here. And inside here, I allocate it to D um, to 10 by 10. And then I can use it just like a normal array here. I still need to deallocate it. So deallocate C here, because now I have taken responsibility for, for that because it just allocates memory. Uh, and then if I don't want to point to a pointer anymore, I can do B uh, points to null, or I can do nullify B as well. So that, that will make B point to nothing. But then you have to be careful. If you have done this, this will crash your program. Because B11, there is no, it doesn't point to anything. Yeah. So this is a really old <laughs> picture from Windows X, but this is what you get when you run it on Windows uh, and try to do this. So let's see what happens if I run it on uh, here, pointers. I have uh, yeah, the same thing here. I create them here, and then I try to do this here. So we uh, set pointers here, and then we try to run. Whoa, I got segmentation for. So there is no protection against this. Uh, you need to make sure that you don't do this, because um, we try to access this from outside. And you can see here that 
when I did this, B got the size 20 by 20, which is the same as A. So B points to the same memory location as A. I created an array C, which was 10 by 10, which checks out. Then I nullified B. But if I, so if I remove this, I'll just comment out this one here, the code will run. So that's, so this is the way you can use pointers. So it's very um, bit complicated, but uh, it also prevents a lot of errors because you need to, you can't point to anything. It, it's also strictly typed. You see here, you, it has, you have to have types on everything. Pointers can actually output the memory address. Uh, can see, like a... I'm not sure you can do that. But uh, this, this uh, to me, this gives the impression that these are just copies of references. It's not really pointers. Yeah, but you see, if, if I do one by access uh, um, a nullified B. Yeah, B is not pointing. No, it, doesn't, yeah. it, doesn't, has a, it doesn't copy the position of A and more. But, like, but like you see, you wouldn't need to specify size of your pointer. You can just say, well, point towards this memory address and if you want access to any part of an array, I would have to do some arithmetic to find its memory position of that position in the array. So it, it's, uh, it doesn't behave the same way. No, it's, it's not like a uh, uh, C, C pointer. C, no, it's not C pointer. Uh, but, but it has the same, I mean, you, there is no performance problems with it. It's just that it's more strict in its what you can. The compiler checks more things before it allows you to do things. I I, I imagine that you, some of the things you, you um, want to do can be done, but I, I think you can't use it with the normal pointers. You need to do some other. I, I can I can I can look into that, but it's um, I know that I, I coded for a long time ago a user interface in Fortran for Windows, and and then you could actually access um, pointers in certain ways to be able to communicate with Windows because it's it's a C API. So there is ways of doing that. Also, don't you want to no. There is a memory leak here, yes. Yeah, no. So uh, <clears throat> you should uh, actually do this. So now we have safe program. But it will crash before that. <laughs> but actually, when the program terminates, uh, all memory will be deallocated. Yeah, but that would be the operating system. Yes. Reclaiming the memory. Or if you have a subroutine in Fortran and you don't deallocate, the subroutine will deallocate before it exits. So if you allocate a, a, a dynamic array in a subroutine, for the, the compiler will ensure that it will deallocate it before it exits. So that, that is a feature that was added in, I think it's Fortran 95, that it, before you actually had to do it you're manually, but now it's, if you don't do it, it will be done automatically. But in this case here, if you have a pointer here, it will not do that. That's the way, it, otherwise you couldn't get the, the memory for that array out of the subroutine. So that, that is one way of, of doing that. But it's possible now that there's even a, a, a you can actually avoid using pointers to do this as well. You can actually, if you have an allocatable array, you could do like this, allocatable here. That would work now in the modern standards as well. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to do a pointer. You can actually pass an allocatable array into the subroutine and allocate it and it goes out. Pointers, so advanced I.O. Um, so I, I touched upon before, uh, list directed I.O. Um, so this is a special format of reading and writing variables to files. And uh, variables are, from, are, from, are separated with spaces of blanks. Uh, you also have, if you output complex numbers, they will be surrounded by parentheses by default. And strings will be enclosed by uh, single quotes and double quotes when output. 
reading and writing variables uh, will require the same format. So uh, if you read a complex number, it has to have parentheses around it to be able to read. If it's a string, it has to be enclosed by quotes. So in this case here, um, we write out strings to the files, the topping here, the C here, which is a complex number. And to be able to read it back here, you the format must be the same. Let's see if I have. So this is the way it writes it or, uh, to, to the file. So in this case, integer space, you have a floating point, and then you have a string, which is in quotes. True or false is either F or T. And the complex number is uh, parentheses, uh, number, and then comma, and then end parentheses as well. So in this case, uh, Python is actually, oh, Fortran is actually a bit better than Python in handling output of its of the built-in data types. So it will read and write text files with this kind of structure. Then we have name list IO. So in this case, we can read a list of name values from a file. And we need to, to those, those values that we should be written to the file has to be defined in a name list structure. And, and input is consists of named value pairs separated with a comma. So in this here, you have uh, and name equals value, name equals the value, back. And you can also contain a race name equals to one, two, three, four, five. Uh, so you can read name value and you can also write name values. And the way you do that is that you, uh, yeah, first you have to declare all your variables here. So I have a number of eggs, liters of milk, kilos of butter, and I have a list here. Uh, I have my identifier for my files. And then I have a define a name list here, food, uh, number of eggs, liters of milk, kilos of butter, and list. So this is what I want to output to my um, file. And then I, def I have to give it a name here, food. So this is my name list. Uh, and then I open my file. Uh, status all means that I want to read an existing file. So this expects that there is a file called something on the disk. And then I just do like this. I just read name list food. That will read all the variables from that file with these named the names here. Same thing here. If if I go the other way around, I can do write iw name list food. That will write all the these named variables to to the file. And I don't have an example. Let's see. See where it produced the files here. You can see I have a food dot txt here. That was I expect. Okay, well, you can see it here. So this is the, the name list file. So here I have a uh, and food. So that is the name is name of the name list. And then you have the variables here: uh, name, value, name, value, name, value. And then you have a list here: one, two, three, four, five. So this is the way Fortran writes it by default. So it, it adds a lot of stuff to it, but. It's, it's a nice way of, if you have a configuration file of your code, you can have a name list that gives this uh, configuration and it reads it really easy and assigns the variables automatically. On unformatted IO, so now if you want to write, um, yeah, sometimes it's not efficient to write using texture representation. You also lose some precision 
if you go back and forth in text and, and floating point, for example. So in, in many cases, it can be more useful to be able to write down the variables with the exact bit patterns. And for, to do that, you need to use unformatted IR. Uh, and then in that case, you uh, no, don't specify your format in your read and write step. You only specify the unit and then the variable that you want to write to disk. So in this case, just read unit A, that reads some variable A from unit in binary form. One thing you have to think about when you do unformat IR is that uh, not all systems write uh, binary data the same thing. So you can't rely on, there isn't a foreground standard for binary files. So depending on the system, they can be different. Today, most systems have an x86 CPU and most systems will write binary files the same on, on the same platform. But you, it's not 100% reliable. Uh, but what you can do is you can use it for reading and writing temporary files. For example, doing a snapshot of all the variables in the simulation step, you can write them down as binary files, as a scratch file to this, and read it back again. And then you know that all the data that you read back is exactly as it was when you saved it. So it's uh, bit per bit the same. Uh, then you also have direct access files. So combined with binary files, you can actually define a way of accessing a file in a random way. So if you, you can if you think of a file divided up in certain uh, records, so that you have a address book, so you have an address entry that is the same, and then you have thousands of those, but you know that each of these are the same size, then you can actually uh, jump in the files back and forth and, and re retrieve these uh, records randomly. Uh, so one thing here you have no if you change the record type, the data, you can't read back a file, an old file that has an older record size. Uh, and also when before you start write, reading and writing, you need to query uh, the length of your record. So you have to check, okay, this this uh, data structure here, how big is it? And then you can use that information to actually uh, read and write, jump back and forth. So here we have unformatted IO. Um, so you can see here, I can I have an account uh, type here that has a 40 character string here. Uh, we have a balance here as well, which is a single position floating point. I have two accounts here, A and B. And, uh, then I have a record size here. Um, that I will use to query the size here. So I can do inquiry, IO length equals the record size account A. That will assign record size, the size of a, uh, of this record size here, the, the, how big account is in, in memory. And then you can assign these two here, and I can write these to disk. And you can see here, I, I specify access direct. I give also record length here, record size, and I want to replace the old file here. So then I write here um, to my unit, and then I specify which record to write to. So this is the first record, the second record, and then I close my file. So let's see here. Yeah. And then if you want to read it back, you need to uh, use a file positioning or a pointer in your file. This is similar to your cursor in your text document that you can move around. And that, at that position, it will read the next record. And then you have backspace unit that will move this invisible pointer one record back. You can rewind to the beginning of the file and you can go to the end of the file. Let's see, I don't have any. So let's see here if I write this file here. Here you can see here that I printed out 44. So this record here that I defined here is uh, 44 bytes in size. 
And that could be, so 40 here, you can see that this is 40 characters that is stored directly. And then after that, we have a real. And by default, a real without a uh, um, data type specification is four bytes. So 40 plus four, that is 44. So that is the record size on disk. And here we have a bit larger example here. We have a particle here with a position. So three floating point and three floating point and a mass. Uh, and we uh, create an allocatable array of arrays here with n particles. So I have put constants here of 1,000 particles. Uh, and then you can, uh, and then I fill them with initialize them here. And then I can write them to disk and format it here. Uh, and in this case, I just write out the particles here. So this is an array of particles. And I just write them down as a binary data dump. And then I can see, I can, I can deallocate the particles here and I try to read them again. I allocate the new structure. And then, then here I put unformatted here to be able to read them. And that's just read particles. That will read the entire uh, file and assign them to the particles array. So let's see here if we can do this. Yeah, you can see it, it printed out, so it's uh, just dumped the particles. Here. We can see there are zero and it read them from the file. And if we look on, on disk, You see, I have a articles file here of 2028K. And that should check out if you have uh, uh, three, six, six times four. Yeah, but that, that should be the size. So that is kind of a, a raw dump of the entire array. So this is one way you can do snapshotting. So you can actually dump all these, all your variables out into a single file and then read them back again uh, and continue from that step. So uh, you are not limited to, in this case, we just have one write statement here, but you're not limited to that. You you can actually have multiple write statements and, and, and uh, those will be, that. the next array will be just close to another one and then, and so on. So if you read them back in the same order that you wrote them, you will get the, the, all the data back from disk. So this is one way you can do do a simple snapshot. Uh, um, let's see here. Can we... So error handling. So in many cases, you can have problems. For example, if you try to open a file that doesn't exist or you don't have permissions, um, you need to be able to handle those error situations. And here is one of the exceptions to not using uh, row numbers in Fortran. So there is a, every open, close, read and write have an error attribute that you can set. Uh, and that is a label where to jump when an error occurs. Uh, I don't think it's the nicest solution, but uh, this is what we have. Uh, and you should, well, a behavior program should implement some kind of uh, error handling when you're reading and writing file, because just to kind of tell the user not, not to kind of just dump, okay, something went wrong. Uh, I couldn't read this file, for example. So in this case here, we have, uh, want to open a file here. Uh, and then you can specify here error, and then you give a label here uh, where to jump. And you can't name those labels, you need to have a number here. So here you have to have a stop here to so make sure that you don't end up here by default. And then you put 99 here just before, and then the statement here that you want to handle it. And the code execution will continue on from this. So this is just a label. So if something goes wrong, it jumps to this position here. So I think I have this here in my example as well.
But here you see, this file doesn't exist. So when I run this code, an error occurred when opening file. So this, in this case, it jumped to this one here. Uh, and you can see it just jumped to this one and I have a stop statement here just to prevent them from running through. So if I remove those, the code will execute and continue here and print three times. So if you have, you can have multiple statements here to handle different error outputs here by having different labels. Uh, let's take a 10 minute break. You can go and get coffee or water or something, and then we continue. So new features. So I will go through some of the, the new features in Fortran as well, which is more recent, uh, 20 hundred something. <laughs> um, so, uh, as I said before, we, you, when you call a subroutine, you needed to do a pointer to be able to allocate it inside a subroutine. Um, allocatable array extension is something that makes it possible to allocate a, a routine or allocate an array inside a subroutine, and then uh, it can be passed out as an output argument as well. So, uh, for example, here, uh, create array here is a routine for creating array. And you can see again, I declared real allocatable A here on top. I call create array, and then you can see here it's, you can use it as normal. And in the previous example I showed you for the pointers, we use pointers here to get it out. And that was uh, the only possible way I think up to Fortran 2008 to do this. But now you have, possible, if you declare your variable inside here, real allocatable intent out, so you want to be able to this is an output variable. You declare it just like you have it here. You can do allocate inside a subroutine without using pointers. Uh, so this will not deallocate A here. It will be because it's intent out, it will go out here and you can use it outside as well. Really nice feature. Uh, allocatable functions. This is also a relatively new thing. Uh, so basically, you can now create. Uh, a variable here a here that you can allocate and return out from a from a subroutine. So you can declare it here reallocate in dimension colon create vector, and then you can allocate create vector here and return it out from the function. So you can create really nice function that basically simulates a allocation routine in another language. Uh, you can also have allocatable components. This was not possible in, I think, before 495, you couldn't do this. But now you have the option that in, in your derived data types, you can have allocatable sections here uh, that you need to allocate up. So th this uh, was something that you couldn't do before. So you now you can create really sophisticated derived data types with dynamic memory references. You could, yeah, you could have, if for pointers, you could have done it. But now you can have the allocated attribute in the derived data type, which you couldn't have before. Um, Submodules, uh, it's, a, mm, I don't go, we don't go through it too much, but if you have really large modules that you have a lot of code in, it's possible to implement a single module using smaller modules. And that is called submodules. You can divide divide up your your source code in multiple small chunks, and they together they will implement a single module. So here you can have submodule points here that adds parts to the points module here. Uh, it's a bit of, I have never used it myself, but it's it's way of, of um, uh, adding functionality existing modules and without adding to the source code. This is more important, C interoperability. And uh, it sounds simple, and it, but there has been no, no clear mapping between C and Fortran before. So Fortran has its own, how you define your own data types. Um, if you were an x86, 
some data types just happen to actually align with the same data types in C. But there was no clear definition in, in the Fortran standard what corresponded to a C data type. And that made it really hard to interface with C libraries when you are coding Fortran. And uh, now there is a special module called ISO C binding, part of the runtime library in Fortran, uh, which contains the definitions of all C data types mapped to Fortran data types. Sounds very simple, but this really solves a lot of problems here that we have had in Fortran before. So we have all this select, uh, real kind, select, in kind, but they, they just solve the problem for Fortran, not for interoperating with other languages. So here you can see you can have, you use C, ISO, bind, ISO C binding here. That provides you with data types here. So if I want to C int or integer in C, you have this C int, you have C float, C double. That guarantees you that this C here is the same data type the, as the corresponding double in C, which actually makes the linking of different routines much, much easier. And also, if you write data to binary files, you can, if you use this, you will be guaranteed that it will write it in, in a C standard way. And you can use them here as uh, suffixes here as well. Uh, really nice thing. Uh, another problem that has so it's it's bit you I have just covered this in really high level, but it's um, when you call routines from either languages, you have to know that by default, Fortran all the possible variables by reference. I talked about it when I go through subroutines, uh, which is not what C does. So in C, all scalar arguments by default are passed by value. Uh, and a value, so an argument that you call a C routine is copied to the subroutine. So there is no direct access to the underlying variable that you, that you call the function with. Uh, what has been done in Fortran to be able to solve this is that you have, you can specify the attribute value of uh, the input arguments to a subroutine, which means that you can actually directly link with C now. So you can you can actually create a function definition in, in Fortran that is identical to C subroutine without any tricks. So I have an example here. Oh, this was not an example. Let's see if we can we have a Okay, I don't tell that, but I will get back to that. But, but the main thing is that you can, in your um, subroutine, declare this attribute here, and, and then you can, uh, by default, let's see, we can do an example. Yeah. So if I have a subroutine here, I call this subroutine. Uh, 
I usually you declare them as real. Go on uh, A integer B. Uh, Like this, and then you have M subroutine. But you can actually, here you can see real value. That, 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 the, this function then, uh, the, the values passed to this one will be copied instead of used by reference. So by using this attribute here, you can declare subroutines that you can call, so, so declaring a subroutine in C that you can call from Fortran or vice versa. So you make sure that it's compatible. So, so this is the way you should do it. And I, I will add an example to the, the Fortran documentation here as well, so we can show how you do this. I thought I had that, but I didn't. Okay. Then we also have uh, object-oriented programming and the thing is that you can now you can have a type your your own uh, derived data type with an object uh, methods connected to it. So in this way you can see you have this contain section here which is new. Here you have your object attributes, and then you can say here that this I have a procedure right here, and that is implemented in write my type here. Uh, and then you can set also what subroutine should be private or not, and then you implement them here. And you can see here, you have yourself, what the important is called this. And then you have class my type this. And then you, it's basically the same as you have in, in, in Python here. You have, instead of self, you have this, and then your my value, this, and my value. So all sub methods that you declare that this part of a, of a class is declared with, you need to declare class my type variable here to be able to access the, uh, class here, and then you can you can declare a class like this, class m type x, and then I can call x right here, and that works just like any other object ordinary languages in that case. So Fortran now kind of can compete with C plus plus and Python in in feature wise here, and uh, so now we have a fully object oriented numerical language that is standardized. And there are actually standard stating commission is actually working on generic uh, data types as well. So you can have a generic do generic pro, uh, generic uh, data types as well, which is has been part of the C language for a time now. And now you can assume you can do that in, in Fortran as well. Another thing that seems very simple which hasn't been part of a standard is actually how you get access to environment variables. There has been no standard in Fortran for actually accessing environment variables, which is uh, something that other languages has been for a long time. In Python, it's import OS, and then you have os.env, which gives access to the environment. Command line arguments, very important in C and also in Python. You can, you can query the argument counter using command argument count, and you can get get command argument here. So these functions here have been added and are part of the standard. So before there were me methods of doing this in, by different compiler vendors, but now there is a standardized way of doing this. So that I want to show you for the lecture today, but I, now I want to just show you how you can use Qt Creator with the extensions that I provided here. So we just close this project here. So this is Qt Creator, and Qt Creator is a development environment for C++ for developing Qt application in C++. But it's also a really nice uh, development environment for Fortran. So what I have done is I have added some extensions and templates which you can install in your Qt Creator installation. It's, it's documented on the web page in the, the how you install it. And when it's installed, you can go up here and do a new project. And then you go down to non Qt project. And here you have plain C if you want to do that, C, but you also have plain Fortran. And you just select my port. 
two like this. Right next. You have to make sure that you have the CMake build system here selected. And then you select your, it should be by default what is installed when you install Qt Creator. And then finish. Then you have, it starts spinning up here. It runs the CMake procedure. And then you can see here that you get your project here. You got you get you get the CMake list file. I will talk about CMake later on. Uh, but you also will get the source code files here, and it will create a default Fortran program. And if you want to run it, you just press the play button here, and it will output into this um, console area here. If you want to add a module to this this uh, project, you can go into File, New File. And then you select Fortran uh, module file. And then you can do uh, my mod F90 next. And then it spins again here and it automatically adds the module here to your file. And now I can go into, so let's see here, you can just subroutine. This and then I go to main here. So and I can build it here. Ah, did you see the error? I haven't told it to use my module. So I have to go in here and I have to use my mod like that. And now it's built it. And now I run it here, it should print out 42, yes. So I'm not sure, something was wrong with my environment before, but it's also possible to debug that code and and you, if you press uh, here in the side here on any row here, you can set breakpoints and and a breakpoint is where uh, the development arm will stop and you can step through the code. So if everything works well, you should be able to press this uh, play button with a small bug, and that will start the debugging process. And now you can see here it stops here on A. And I just remove myself from the screen so you can see. And you can also see here that uh, there is a value here, and it shows you the values inside the what variables available. And now you can see this is undefined. It just happened to be zero, which is unfortunate. It could be anything here. And then you can see here that you have several tools here below, which you can use for the first one here is. Uh, called step over that will execute the, the statement and continue to the next line. If you have a subroutine, you can do step into that will go into the subroutine and continue execution there. And if you want to go out from a subroutine, you can do step out and it will finish the execution and go back to the, the calling routine. So let's see if we step over here because this is not something we can step into. 
Now we can see here that it changed to 42 here. And then we can try uh, stepping into this routine uh, with this here. Now you can see we, we ended up inside this subroutine. And you can see here that A here is 42, so it's passed over here. And then we can step out and we continue here our execution after this point. And then we step over here. And if you will, now you can also uh, ask it to continue the execution to the finish and then we just the code will, will, will terminate. You can also, if you have an um, array declared, so real um, colon B divided by 20. We can see here B equals to zero, not zero here. And we just execute it again here. You can see here that it shows you RB as well. And now you can see here that it's located at some memory location. It's uh, 20 by 20. And you can actually also see the contents of, of each cell. It's not optimized for uh, displaying Fortran arrays, but you can come out. And here you can see the effects of an undefined array. So this just shows you a lot of garbage values here because it's it has been allocated but there is no values assigned to it. So using that by default, and expecting it to be zero is not a good idea. So let's step over here and just see what happens if we call B here. And now you can see all the values of array was assigned. There is also uh, another nice feature I have uh, added a template for common data types. So if you do file, new file here, and you select uh, Fortran, and then you can Fortran data type constants module file. So let's do data types. Next. So I have added some data type constants here that you can use. Um, those you can use as, uh, for example, let's see here, going to main, we use and here we declare them as what do we have now? You can switch uh, files here on top here as well, and we take let's say uh, Ah, okay, so real can here. Let's stop. So RK should be fine. Now we need also to because we call hello here, and that is not. Uh, I think it will not compile. Let's see. Yeah, you can see here. Uh, I change the data type here, and I try to call hello with uh, with the real RK, and you see here that try to pass real A to real four. That means I redefined real, and I pushed it into the subroutine. It doesn't fit, so you get this error here. So we need to go into my mod here. We need to use data types. And then we have to declare here as well, real RK like this. And then it should build this. And now we can we run it here again with a debugger and see what happens. So now you, now you can see here, it will also show you the kind here. So real kind equals to eight. So that means that you have a, um, larger floating point value. So it's it's 64 bits. And you can also see that the array is also now real kind eight. And if we go in here a bit more, you can see also that it has higher uh, precision. If we run it, step over. There is one thing that you should uh, notice also, be aware of is that 
if I want to input a value, for example, uh, uh, read star comma star a, you can compile and run this program. No. I'm a bit confused. That usually that seems to. Let's see if I run this from the command line instead. Um, Now it works. So the thing is that if you, if you don't specify, if you go into the project settings here, run, run in terminal, you will not be able to enter a number here. So 32.0. Now it now it, you can run the code here and you can get the input as well. So if you don't, if you have require input from the terminal, you need to go into here and check this point. If you don't have that, you don't have to do that. But if you want to, be able to use read from command line, you need to do that. So if you have a statement like this, read from keyboard, I think it's will work even if I do like this now. Yeah, you see you have a terminal here and you can type 42. And also if you have, you, I think it's, uh, it works, with the, it, it, it was nice to convert an integer to a floating point automatically here as well. So it worked. So that was what I'm going to show you today. Uh, uh, the instructions for installing Qt Creator should be uh, on the web page, and there should be links to that. You need to unpack a zip file in a certain folder to make to install the templates. It um, should should work. I, I think I have tested that. And uh, but you can of course you can also compile from the command line. Uh, and uh, in an upcoming lecture, I will also go through. This magic thing here that is called the CMake lists.txt is for creating and building files in a standardized way on different platforms. Uh, but now you, know, you just need to know that if you open a project, you open the CMake list files and it will work. And also the, the project you create in, in Qt Creator will be CMake based. <laughs>